Yeah, nice to see you. Glad you guys showed up. We've had a, a real full week. My, my wife, um, she's written a new book, and uh, it, it will be out later this year. Um, I, I think November, I don't know, I, I lose track. But it's on health. And uh, I, uh, I have strong convictions for health. Uh, about 50% of my heart is fanatical towards health. I'm, I'm about 90% count me in. And then I got about 10% that just says, you know, just eat whatever you want because it'll all work out, you know. So, but, but they, uh, our Bethel TV crew uh, with our, our publisher, Destiny House Publishing, was at the house this week doing uh, a number of DVDs, getting ready for curriculum in this area. And, you know, it's really fascinating. I, I am unusually excited for this book to come out and curriculum because uh, I've watched as people who don't know anything about us or don't know her at all will prophesy that she has a book in her about health and that she's to write it. And I just believe that God wants us healthy. And uh, so it's, it's been a real fun journey. So anyway, that's coming out. We did that this week. I had uh, a class. Um, I took my book, um, Strengthen Yourself in the Lord, and we made a curriculum out of that as well. And uh, excited for that to come out. We, we, I spent uh, a couple days here with our crew and a whole bunch of you showed up and, and uh, we did eight sessions. I, I think we almost overdosed people. Almost got overdosed, but that's a good way to die, you know. <clears throat> overdose on the scripture on how to be strong and stable and all of that. So anyway, very, very fun. Good week. <clears throat> um, which brings me to the subject for this morning. I, I felt like... Um, I was just pondering this earlier, that there are certain subjects that probably ought to be reviewed somewhat regularly. And I was, I was uh, just thinking about our last, I've been, we've been here 19 years, and I've been thinking about the last 19 years, how often the Lord has brought, either from one of our own staff or frequently from a guest speaker will come in and speak on forgiveness, on walking in forgiveness. And it's just been astonishing to me how often the Lord brings that subject up again and again, which only reminds me of the absolute need of us to continually uh, stay current with that walking in forgiveness, walking in forgiveness, forgiving people, living in the forgiveness of the Lord. And uh, the second area I, uh, I did the, the curriculum on this week is on bringing strength to yourself. It basically, what to do with loss and disappointment is really what it comes down to. It's what Chris led us in prayer in this morning. And I think those two things, disappointment and the area of resentment or bitterness, are the two greatest cripplers in the body of Christ. And uh, to be able to hit those two well consistently, repeatedly, I think it's a pretty big deal. So we've done that. I'm going to do a, th a third area today. Uh, in, in other words, I'm going to repeat something that we've done a number of times through the years only because I feel, uh, feel very strong uh, that we need to review this, go through it again. I found out um, after the first uh, service this morning that Chris had done the exact same thing earlier this week. And of course, we, we don't compare notes because I don't have them. So, um, but uh, we, we, we didn't talk ahead of time. But it's, it's, it's always an encouragement to me when that happens because it just means this is what the Lord is writing on. So here's what I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about spiritual warfare specifically the mind. How many of you have learned that the battleground is the mind uh, in, in spiritual warfare? The Bible uh, instructs us very uh, specifically what to do in spiritual warfare in the area of the mind, taking captive thoughts, those kinds of things. So I've got three areas of Scripture. We may only read one of them, and then I'll quote the others uh, just to see if we can save some time on this one. So go uh, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to read a couple of verses out of there, and we'll, uh, we'll just get started. The basic premise for what we're going to study is in these verses... The Apostle Paul talks about pulling down strongholds. If you would picture a stronghold, a, uh, like in biblical days, Old Testament times, it would be a walled city or perhaps a castle comes to mind. <laughs> Maybe I've watched too much TV, but a, a big place where an army, a, a battalion can hide within this castle. And these castles, these walls of cities are made of huge stones. 
And the Bible talks about tearing down these strongholds. And these stones basically, according to this passage, these stones are basically thought patterns that war against the knowledge of God. These are ideas and ideals that are in conflict with what God says. And, uh, and the enemy actually inhabits these realms of thought. A stronghold is where an army will rest so that they can go out from there and do exploits. So it's a resting place where, so the enemy hides safely in the thought life, not the imagination in the sense that you're imagining this, but the reality is in the, in the broken thoughts of people, inconsistent with the knowledge of God, it's where the enemy is concealed and is safe to hide. And from there, he works to kill, steal, and destroy. So let's take these passages and then I'll, uh, we'll just start talking, all right? I should probably turn to that chapter myself. Here it is, Second Chron- uh, Corinthians, not Chronicles, Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Look at verse 4 and 5 again. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. Some of the translations will say reasonings or imaginations. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So here is this picture of dealing with ideas, thoughts that are completely separate from the ideas of God, the thoughts of God, the plans of God. Let me back up. We can't afford to entertain thoughts about us that he doesn't think about us. The moment we do, we entertain a lie and we actually war against the very purposes of God in our life. When we dwell on feed those things that are contrary to his word over us, we actually war against. That's why the Bible says the flesh set on, excuse me, the mind set on the flesh is death. It cannot obey God. It cannot obey God. So the mind that is contrary to the purposes of God actually sets us up for failure, sets us up to be incapable of doing the very commanded direction that the Lord has given us. So here this scripture gives us this picture, the picture of strongholds being pulled down by taking thoughts captive and specifically casting down, it's a violent term, casting down thoughts, imaginations, reasonings that are inconsistent with God. It's the target of the Lord for you and for me every single day of our life. He is looking for you and me to know the mind of Christ and to live as a model or an illustration of the mind of Christ. It's not just that we think happy moral thoughts. That's, that's, that's a no-brainer. That's absolutely true. But he thinks completely different, completely different. When he warned the disciples, not warned, excuse me, when he began to teach them about the influences, the potential influences in their life that were negative, he warned them in Mark 8, he said, be careful of the leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees. Be careful of the religious system where God is at the center, but he's impersonal and powerless. And be careful for Herod, the political system where it, humanism, it's humanistic in nature. Be careful for these influences over the way you think. And so he began to talk to them with this analogy about leaven. And the disciples re- responded in fear because they didn't have enough food for lunch. So they only slightly missed the subject. <laughs> he was talking to them about influence on the mind. They thought he was talking about, did you bring food for lunch? So they completely missed the lesson entirely. And they started doing fear. Now, every response we have in life is, is either out of love or it's out of fear. It's either love or fear. Love or fear is the source 
of our words, our responses, our directives in life, the things that we pursue, the things we choose not to pursue, it's either because of love or it's because of fear. Some, in some way, one of those two realms have influenced how we think and see. So when Jesus talks to his disciples, they're now in fear mode because they don't have enough food for lunch. Jesus asks the question, and the New King James, it says, why do you reason that you have no bread? New American Standard, why do you discuss that you have no bread? That word, reason or discuss, comes from the root word that's found here in this passage in 2 Corinthians, imaginations speculations, high things that have been raised up against the knowledge of God. So here he's saying, why is your reasoning at war with my world? You are considering and dwelling on a reality that violates how I live, how I think, and what I've assigned you to do with your life. Amen, Bill. That was a very good point. All right. So Jesus is challenging their thinking. When you first get saved, the first thing we start dealing with is what we think about. If we find ourselves thinking with hatred or with greed or lust or envy or whatever it might be, we, those things get exposed to us. But after a while, we start finding out God is not just interested in the individual thoughts. He's interested in the process of thinking, the way we think, the way we view things around us. The disciples are in a boat with no more than one loaf of bread. They don't have enough food for lunch. They go into fear mode. Jesus says, why do you reason that you have no bread? And then he reminded them they were with him when he multiplied food for thousands and thousands of people twice. Why do you reason that you have no bread? Why does your imagination start with what you don't have? How many of you have been in a financial crisis before? How many of you have had God do a miracle and provide for you? How many of you after that financial crisis, you had another one, even though God answered the first one? How many of you were as nervous the second time as you were the first time? All right, that's the point. That's his question. Why do you reason? Why didn't you change the way you think because you saw my nature? See, we tend to think that the miracles of God are temporary interventions. Instead, they are revelations of nature, the nature of a God who makes covenant with his children. Now, there are always two trees in the garden. There's always one you eat from, and there's always one you don't eat from. And the reason is because of the nature of God. It's not punishment. He just sets us up to be rewarded. If there's not two trees, one good, one bad, in your garden of life, then you can't be rewarded for making the right choice. And if you have no choice, no options, we can't say you have a free will. One of the most priceless creations of God is when he gave humanity free will. And he, he lives and dies, if you will, to protect that mountain, to protect the reality of free will given to people. And so he places two trees in the garden so that you have a choice. So how many of you, um, you were challenged financially at some time in your life? We'll use money as a good example here. It could have been in offerings, could have been helping the poor, could have been uh, caring for a neighbor that was in crisis. It, it could have been any of those things. So mission support, somebody uh, on the other side of the planet. And you took a risk, you, you, you took that risk, you gave some money and God quickly returned it to you, to you and you were stunned at how fast he did a miracle financially in your life. I mean, you, you've had that happen. All right, all right. How many of you, after that happened, you took another risk and the answer wasn't as quick the second time? Is, is, that, is that right or what? I mean, I, I see it all my life, especially with new believers. They come in, they can, they can take any risk they want. And it's like, bang, the answer is there. You know, it's like they could give their last hundred dollars and they walk out of the room and find a thousand on the ground. It's just like the Lord is so quick to answer these folks. What is he doing? He's revealing his nature. He's not just revealing an act of God. And part of the problem with Israel's failure and Moses' maturity is found in this phrase. Israel was acquainted with the acts of God. Moses was acquainted with his ways. Moses took the acts of God and discovered his nature to make covenant with that God. That's why he was stable during the shifting seasons and Israel was not. 
So that first answer to prayer, you take the risk, you give the $100 to your neighbor that's in crisis, and you know a week later, he, he returns to you 10 times over, and you just are so thankful. You come running to your friends to tell the testimony. A month later, you do the same, and it's two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks go by, and you wonder, where is this God who made covenant with you to always care for you? What is he doing? He just put a second tree in your garden. Are you going to let the absence of an immediate breakthrough change your revelation of God's nature? Are you going to allow it to change your perception of who he is? Because this is the issue. It is reasoning that is contrary to the knowledge of God. The Bible says these imaginations are high things. They are things that the demonic realm exalts to be in competition with what God knows to be true. So every lie that you and I have ever believed is actually something that comes from the demonic realm that the enemy wants to put in competition to what God knows to be true. Now, how many of you know the devil is no competition for God? It is not God and the devil. It's not like, you know, God is good and the devil is bad and they're they're opposites. The devil is a created being. He's the opposite of Michael, not God. He's no competition for God. As we speak, the Lord himself uses the devil as a chess piece on a, on a game board. No, it's absolutely true. He has already been defeated. He has no feet. Defeated. No. Defeated. Sorry. Bad, bad sense of humor. Bad sense of humor. He's already been defeated. The Bible says you'll see him on the last day and you'll look at him and you'll say, you're kidding. It was you? So what makes the lie that is in competition, if you will, against the knowledge of God, what God knows, what makes it powerful? It's our yes. See, our vote to believe a lie is what makes the lie powerful because it has no power at all that can compete with the beauty, the wonder, and the power of truth. Let's drink to that. (laughs) It's an interesting, it's an interesting statement made in uh, Matthew 16. And I'll just give you the story, the background, and you can you can write the reference down, verse 20, 23 in that area. And it's it's the place where. Jesus comes to his disciples and he says, uh, who do people say I am? And the, the guys are there and they're talking. They go, well, you know, some think you're Elijah. Some think, you know, you're this guy. And uh, Jesus finally pops the question. He says, but who do you think I am? And Peter goes, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus said, yeah, you know, you didn't get that on your own, Peter. My father showed you that. A moment later, Jesus is talking about the fact that he's going to die. He's going to be crucified. And Peter stops that conversation right away because, why? Wow, he's on a roll. <laughs> he stops that and he starts to correct Jesus. How many of you have discovered out of your own experience, it's not smart to correct God. He's just, he's just kind of an immovable person. He's right, period. And so he corrects Jesus and Jesus changes his tune. A moment earlier, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. That came to you from my heavenly father. The next moment he looks at Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan, because your mind is not set on the interests of God. Your mind is set on the interests of man. So here's this, here's this crazy picture. Peter is rebuked by Jesus, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, because your mind is not set on the things of God. Your mind is fixed on the things of man. Get behind me, Satan, your mind is fixed on the things of man. Humanity without Christ at the center is demonic in nature. Try this side. Humanity without Christ at the center is demonic in nature. Jesus truly is the center of everything. In him, all things consist. 
Everything was made by him and for him. He is the absolute center of everything. When you move Jesus out of the picture, you end up with something that's a good try. But it can never become what God intended. And so here Jesus rebukes Peter, says, get behind me. Why? Because your mind has been set on the interest of man without Christ at the center. Your interests are not set on God. What's the point? There, well, there's something that, that uh, I've heard referred to as practical atheism. I don't think atheism is very practical, but anyway, practical atheism. If I have a financial crisis in my life, and let's say I have a neighbor that's an atheist, and we both have the exact same crisis goes on, and I'm talking to him one day, and he bought this book, and he talked with this banker and got advice from this financial counselor, and I'm a believer, and I don't open the Word to find out direction from Scripture. I don't pray. I don't do any of the things that the Bible would direct me to do, but instead I follow the exact same tools that my atheist neighbor would follow, which may even be decent tools. The problem is what is missing from my life is seeking the heart of God, the mind of God over my circumstance. So let's say that I ignore all the things that I would normally do as a believer, and I do what my atheist neighbor would do. What is the outcome? That's practical atheism. Even though I believe in the existence of God, he wasn't brought into the center of my situation. And while I can on the outside say, yes, I'm born again, yes, I'm going to spend eternity with God, in that particular part of my life, I am practicing atheism. Because Jesus is not at the center. Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is set on the interest of man without Christ at the center. The Apostle Paul in... Um, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, uses this phrase. Uh, there, there are many people who, who have mistakenly believed that if you're a Christian, you can't have a problem with a demon. That's not the subject that I have for you this morning. But the Apostle Paul taught to a very mature church. He said, don't give place to the devil. About three verses before that phrase, don't give place to the devil, is the exhortation to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Inconsistent thoughts, thoughts that violate the purposes of God over our life. They, they, are, they are like the blocks in a wall. And the enemy doesn't inhabit a thought in the same way he inhabits a pattern of thinking. A pattern of thinking that wars against the purposes of God actually create a realm of safety for him to hide in and dwell in and to attack from. This whole issue that I am, am, have had in my heart to talk to you about today is not devil-focused at all. In fact, you know that whenever we teach on this subject, we never make it about chasing the devil. He's not worthy of my attention. Only long enough to get the crosshairs on him and pull the trigger. <laughs> it's not worthy of our discussion or infatuation. I have zero interest. But when it gets in the way, when there's a problem that has been created because I've given myself to believe something that is in violation to what God knows to be true, then I must repent and deal with that pattern of thought. I mean, you know, it's one thing to just confess the sin. It's another to change the way you think about that subject. It's the reason the word repentance doesn't mean cry at the altar, even though that may be a legitimate expression. The word repentance means to change the way you think. So to truly repent about something that he deals with me on means that that sorrow for sin has to be deep enough that it changes my perspective on what's true and what's a lie. Every lie that the enemy has ever presented to you and to me throughout our entire life has always been something he has raised up. In fact, the word here is it is a, an exalted thought, an exalted idea. I've never seen a time when there's been more intentional raising up of exalted ideas that undermine the work of the gospel. I've never seen it in my life. I, I'm happy to rejoice and say I've never seen such breakthrough as I see right now. 
the extraordinary miracles of, of uh, addictions broken off literally in moment, moments, 10, 20, 30 years of heroin addiction or whatever it might be, just broken off literally in moments. Seeing uh, cancers healed. We had testimony this morning of uh, a lymphoma that was healed. Uh, we, we, have, we have constantly, we have, we have the breakthrough in the physical realm. We have the mental illness that gets healed. Over 60 cases that I know of of bipolar that have been completely healed and restored. It, it just doesn't matter. I, I talked with a gentleman, the power of God went through him. It was like lightning, literally. He's schizophrenic. Lightning went through him. I saw him a year later and he's completely in his right mind, and he has brought deliverance to a great, great number of other people because Jesus actually put him in order, put him together. So we're seeing breakthroughs on high levels with CEOs and political leaders in the low levels. We just had an a individual converted, I believe it was this week, uh, who has been guilty of the worst crimes you can imagine, and the Lord saved him and brought deliverance to him just this, this past week. So here's the point. We're seeing extraordinary breakthrough, but don't think for a moment that those breakthroughs come without the enemy trying to exalt ideas that war against the knowledge of God, what God knows to be true. What's vital for you and for me is to realize that in every situation of our life, every time we get a breakthrough, there's another two trees planted in the garden. Every time there's a breakthrough, you get an economic breakthrough, guess what? A second tree just got planted in your garden. It has to be that way. You have to have options besides what God says. You have to have the option. Why? Because it's the only way you break into reward. He's a rewarder. His own nature is described as a rewarder. Those who come to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Because he is a father who loves to reward and to bless and to give honor and to celebrate people, because he is that way, he must give you an option so that he has a reason for reward. That's, I'm telling you the truth. Yep. All right. In the Mark 8 passage where I talked to you about Jesus asking the question, why do you reason that you have no bread? His next question is, is your heart still hard? What, what's the lesson? The lesson was they saw miracles of provision and now they're fearful of not having enough. Whenever we've seen the miracle of provision we lost the right to begin any thought process with what we don't have. That's the expense of the miracle realm, is every time there's a miracle, he reveals his nature. And that nature is always carries with it the invitation for encounter, for covenant, making covenant with a God who never fails. So his next question is, is your heart still hard? What's the point? A hardened heart poisons the mind. Let me give one more illustration for this. <clears throat> it's out of the, the other spiritual warfare chapter. It's Ephesians 6. And in this particular passage, Paul does something very similar to here, except he starts to describe what has been given to us to keep us safe and then what has been given to us to give us advancement. And he starts by saying in Ephesians 6, he says, you have the helmet of salvation. Think saved. Eventually, you're going to have to believe you're born again. That's, that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. Eventually, that's what's going to have to happen. I'm joking with you, you already do, but you understand the point. The point is, think saved. The helmet of salvation protects the mind. Breastplate of righteousness, your vitals are protected by the righteousness of God himself. 
loins girded with truth. The strength is the fact that we are firmly established in the truth of the gospel. Our feet are covered with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These boots that these soldiers would wear, these were Roman, uh, a Roman soldier analogy. They had spikes in them so that they would position themselves in the ground and in opposition, they couldn't be driven back because they were too stable in their footing. There was no armor on their back because never does the believer turn and run. Because the believer is fighting from the victory of Christ towards an express victory in the earth. We're not fighting for the defeat of the enemy. He's already been defeated. And then it talks about the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is the tool now of the enemy? It's a fiery dart. I'd like to suggest to you that the target is the mind. The target is thought processes now that are exalted or raised up against what God knows to be true. What do we use to quench those fiery darts, those suggestions of the enemy? It's the shield of faith. What happens if you get hit by a fiery dart gets past your faith? You have the sword of the spirit. What you may not realize is this sword was not a long sword to do a sword fight with. This was a small Roman dagger that was used to dig arrows out of himself. So an arrow gets past the shield of faith and gets you. What do you do? You take the word of God. Did you get it? You take the word of God to minister to yourself. I don't believe the enemy ever got an arrow past Jesus' shield of faith, but he did model what it was like to minister to himself with the word of God. The enemy says, turn this stone into bread. Man shall not live by bread alone. So you find him ministering to himself with the word of God. A friend of mine was in a debate several years ago at a university campus. The professor had done everything he could to mock my friend who was a fire-breathing evangelist, which is the only kind to have, fire-breathing, fire-breathing evangelist. And he did everything he could to not only mock him, but to tear down the scripture. One great philosopher, Voltaire, announced that within 50 years, the Bible would be non-existent, non-used by the public. Today, his house is used for the distribution of Bibles. And so my friend that was being assaulted had a debate with this professor. And my friend just stood up very simply at the end of this discussion. And he said, everything that this man has written will be forgotten in 20 years. Armies bigger than him have been raised up to destroy this book. And he went on to talk about the word of God stands forever. And this is to be what shapes how we think about us, about one another. This book reveals him. One last thought. I think I already said one last thought, but that was actually a part of this one last thought. I think I'm allowed three before I start lying. Uh,
Jesus said, you study the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. He's speaking to the Pharisees whose life was around the study of scripture. He wasn't putting down the study of scripture. He was just exalting what the study of scripture is supposed to lead to. And so he brought this word of correction to them. And he said, in John 5, he says, you study the scripture because you think in them is eternal life. He said, these testify of me, and you're not willing to come to me. In other words, the word of God is to lead to an encounter with the word of God. The black and white leads to the person, and without the encounter with the person, the process is incomplete. If you have only an encounter with the printed page, you become equipped enough to debate with people who disagree. But when we have encounters with the person, we walk away with nothing but supreme value for people, with affection, love, and devotion for people. Not compromising truth, but realizing love is what changes the life. The Lord is raising up an army of people who can say like Jesus did, Satan has nothing in me. There's no part of my history. There's no part of my history. My history declares the effectiveness of the blood of Jesus. Anytime we visit the events of our past, apart from the blood of Jesus, we visit a lie because it no longer exists. My history shouts the power of the blood of Jesus. My present demonstrates the absolute love and affection and purpose of God for my life. My future is drawing me into a fulfilled, hope-filled life that has purpose of seeing on earth as it is in heaven. I get to be a part of a team that daily fights for and pours our life out to see this very thing happen, that broken people get mended, that addicted get free, that those who need forgiveness get forgiven, those who are dying get healed, that the Lord demonstrates demonstrates in and through us what he demonstrated on the pages of Scripture. It's not meant to be a historical book. It's meant to be the living testimony of what God is like. Because every time we see that thing raised up against the knowledge of God, we anchor ourselves into the revelation of a perfect Father who loves us so much that he gave us the life of his own Son. This perfect Father woos us into relationship so that we get to model and demonstrate the very heart of God in the earth. That's spiritual warfare 101. That's what it is. Why don't you stand? Romans chapter 6 gives us such an incredible picture of conversion. The book of Romans is the book on salvation. It is the book that deals with the theology of conversion more profoundly, more deeply than any other book. Probably more than all the others combined. Chapter 6, it's interesting because he, the Apostle Paul is taking us through this picture of Jesus dying raising from the dead, and his resurrection actually being our resurrection. It's an incredible picture, and he uses baptism to illustrate it. He says, all right, you go under the water, that's your grave. You come out of the water, that's resurrection life, and that's the life of Christ in you. And he takes us through this picture. He, he, he takes us through this dialogue for about 10 verses, and the 11th verse is the prize. He said, all right, You've been, just as Jesus has been raised from the dead, so you have been raised in newness of life. And then here's the conclusion. Even so, or consistently with that reality, consider yourself dead to sin. That word, consider yourself, that's the same word as the words for imagination. 
speculations. Watch for the things that have been raised up against the knowledge, what God knows to be true, the knowledge of God. And what does God know to be true? You're dead to sin. Think of yourself this way. I'm dead. <laughs> yep, I'm dead. Dead. Dead, 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 dead. I'm dead. Dead to sin. It's like a third shoe. Have no use for it. Dead. Dead to sin. It's not mental gymnastics. It is what God knows to be true. Adjust this to his this. What he says, what he thinks. That was the third and final ending. I just realized I ended it again. Oh, goodness. All right, Jesus, help us. Let's have the ministry team come on down real quick, if you would. We're going to pray together before I release you, so hang on just a moment. Ministry team, come on down. These, these folks are trained for your breakthrough. And I tell you, at least 95%, probably more, but at least 95% of the thousands of miracles we've seen have been done through the hands of people in the church, not through the pastoral team. So we've got a team here that would love to serve you and pray for you. So as soon as I'm done, if you need to know the Lord, you maybe don't know the Lord. You know what? Today's the day just to know what it is to be not only forgiven of sin, but given eternal life. Today's the day. Let's put your hand on your heart. Let me pray for you. Father, I ask for the honor of the name Jesus that you'd continue to launch us into the mind of Christ, how, how you think, how you think, how you see, how you perceive. There's no hardness there. There's just tenderness. You don't extinguish a candle that's about to go out. You protect it so that the flame gets higher. You just have that way about you that just protects the good things in us. And I pray that, that our thoughts this week would come out of that understanding of what you're like as the ultimate father. I pray this in Jesus' name, that today also would be a day where addictions are broken. People come